Hello, everyone, and welcome so much uh, to this webinar. It's the first webinar that we are doing in the um, Pediatric Spiritual Care Research Network, which is uh, sponsored by Transforming Chaplaincy. And we are really excited about the topic today. Um, trisomy 18 and 13 um, is a condition that I think all of us who work in NICU, um, who work with children, have seen uh, is a genetic condition. It is not uncommon, although it is rare. Um, and there are a lot of questions that we have as chaplains around what is the best kind of care to provide um, in these cases, and I would say also in other cases where um, the diagnosis is life limiting for our patients, um, especially in a neonatal context. And I think we have a lot of questions as well around the ethics. Um, I really came to this topic um, and decided that this was a great plan for our first webinar by reading um, Reverend Patrick, Patrick Jinx's case study in one of the case study books um, that is published by Jessica Kingsley Publishers. Um, it is a case study around a family um, for whom trisomy 18 and 18 was the diagnosis of their daughter. And I thought Patrick did a great job raising um, both ethical issues and pastoral issues um, and simply narrating um, his care for this family. I do have a PowerPoint here that I'm gonna go ahead and share. And the format today is that I am gonna introduce um, our guest, Patrick. Um, and he is gonna share his case study. Um, so this is accessible if you haven't ever seen that case study, though I um, am gonna provide um, a link in the network to where you can buy these books. Um, some of your departments do have them. Um, and I do encourage you to read his case study and the other pediatric case studies. Um, so he'll be describing his case study. And then we have um, a neonatal ethicist with us today. We're so excited to have Dr. Laventhal. Um, she is both a neonatologist and an ethicist. So she really um, kind of has her hand in all of these questions. And she does work with chaplains, which is excellent. Um, as well as we're gonna dip today, um, dip our toes into what, what does it mean to write a case study? Uh, Patrick was a first time case study author when he wrote his case. Um, and what would that look like too for more chaplains, especially pediatric chaplains to write case studies? So Patrick Jinx, um, I have gotten to know him through this and he's a super friendly guy, um, <laughs> but he is faculty of the Pediatric Chaplains Institute which many of you know is training through uh, the Pediatric Chaplains Network. He is a pediatric chaplain and the spiritual care coordinator um, at Prism, Prisma Health um, in Greenville, South Carolina. Um, he's board certified and he uh, graduated from Princeton. Um, Patrick wrote this case study. It was the first time he wrote a case study. Um, and I, I just love his description of his care and I'm looking forward to hearing him share it. So thanks so much, Patrick. Thank you, it's a pleasure. I hope everyone's having a good afternoon. Um, it is a, a bit of an endeavor to, to not only uh, write a case study, it feels like uh, something that is kind of crazy because I'm not a researcher, um, but this experience and the process both of, of writing and also now being able to share has been really good. And, and I hope it continues not only to inform our understanding of care and what spiritual care is and the ethics around uh, care for difficult topics, but also um, I hope it also encourages others to, to maybe uh, dip a toe in the pool of writing uh, these case studies as well. And we'll talk more about that. So I'm going to take about the next 15 minutes and share um, this case with you. And, and as Kate said, it's, it's published in, um, in the collection of case studies, and you can find that in a little bit more expanded version if you have an interest in that in the future. The family I want to tell you about is Jessica and Steve James. Uh, Jessica was in her 40s, Steve in his 50s, when they found out that they were pregnant. Jessica and Steve had a son uh, three years old at the time of this pregnancy. And um, it's important to note that uh, this pregnancy was really, really hoped for and desired and hard to come by. At 20 weeks of uh, gestational age, they had their normal anatomy scan, which showed some concerning signs for, um, for some body features that were not uh, typical. And so they went into further testing and that testing showed a diagnosis of trisomy 18. 
as it was described a moment ago, trisomy 18 is a genetic condition and we won't get into all the medical pieces today, but I do think for our purposes, it's important to know it's a chromosomal abnormality that often leads to heart defects, um, abnormalities of formation of limbs, sometimes the lungs and other body organs, and significant neurological delays. Uh, trisomy 18 is a diagnosis that historically um, would have a recommendation from a gen from a OB standpoint of perhaps um, ending a pregnancy uh, early or um, carrying to uh, full gestation, but then also um, providing comfort care. It isn't until more recently that you start to see cases where families choose uh, more aggressive inter interventions, and it's not until pretty recently that. Um, surgeons and others are willing to provide further interventions. It's important to note that um, the natural history is often for a miscarriage or a stillbirth. Uh, it, very, uh, of the number of pregnancies, very few um, end up surviving to term. So I want to tell you about the James family. The James family, after they received the diagnosis of trisomy 18, um, were given the option to either terminate their pregnancy or carry it uh, to delivery at, at full gestation. Um, the family decided that they um, wanted to carry to term. They had done some internet research on their own. Um, they had found some internet sites with um, family blogs and family information that said, hey, maybe there's a hope that this baby can be born alive. And so they opted to carry to term. Uh, the James family um, is not too unlike many families that we see um, that find information and find this, um, this semblance of hope, this nugget of hope that perhaps they can be one of the five to eight percent that survive through the, the first year of life. Um, typically, uh, children with trisomy 18 do not survive past one year of life without significant medical interventions. The James family, after they made the decision to carry their pregnancy, decided that they um, uh, would need some help and the, the team, the palliative care team, was consulted to work with them on goals of care and to make a plan for what comes next. I came to know the, uh, the James family uh, through the palliative care team. After they had met with the family, um, the team had recognized that spirituality was really important to this family. Um, they used a lot of religious language. Uh, their particular background uh, was Christian. Um, and so um, when uh, the patient, uh, Mrs. James, was unexpectedly admitted to the hospital um, a couple of weeks later, um, she was in distress. She was worried. Um, it ended up that she was worried that the doctors weren't going to honor her wishes, that they weren't going to listen to what the family wanted, that they might not try hard enough um, to help her uh, and to help the baby whom they had named Sarah. Um, and so she was in a lot of distress. Um, after that nurse practitioner's first encounter, um, she asked me as a chaplain to go and to visit this family and to provide spiritual support, but also to kind of assess what their next needs would be. And so the first encounter that I want to share with you is uh, when I met the James family for the first time, and particularly when I met Jessica, the mother. She had been admitted for pregnancy complications and she was on bed rest and she had already been in the hospital for a couple of days. And when I came uh, to the room in the hospital and, and introduced myself, um, she immediately started talking. Uh, it kind of surprised me. It took me uh, by surprise that she um, launched straight into all the things that she was worried about. And she was kind of agitated. She was worried that, and she truly expressed fear that the doctors weren't going to follow their wishes. She expressed that she hoped for the baby, for baby Sarah to be able to, to, um, to survive at least until delivery, and that she hoped that they'd be able to hold her alive. For Jessica and for her husband, even the fact that um, the baby had made it to this point in gestation uh, signaled that there was a particular uh, favor from God. Um, and she expressed with lots of religious language that she had a strength and a hope in God's presence a strength and a hope in God's provision, God's ability to help her and to intervene and help Sarah, the baby, to beat the odds. As we talked and as she expressed more, she shared that her particular tradition was the Pentecostal tradition. And for her, that meant that, um, that God uh, took a very active role uh, in one's life and that God would, in fact, 
um, help this baby to get to um, delivery. Faith was exceedingly important to her, and she expressed that she really felt quite detached from her church, in part because she wasn't able to, um, to get uh, to church, obviously, but she lived a long way away from church, and they weren't able to get to her either. And so she was missing that community. She was missing the people who loved her the most um, as she was away from her own husband and her son, as she was away from um, her church community. And so through that conversation, um, she expressed that faith uh, was something that she used for coping, that she used um, to make sure that um, Sarah was doing okay, and that she uh, found prayer to be something that was really important to her, both for meaning, but also for coping. And so that first visit concluded with a prayer that um, I asked if it would be okay to pray for, and she said yes, and, and we prayed. And... Um, you know, we prayed especially for Sarah. We prayed for the story that they had already begun together as a family. Um, we prayed for peace and patience as Jessica waited and, and on bed rest indefinitely. Um, and for understanding and compassion for her care team. And in that prayer, part of uh, my intention and my hope was to um, help uh, perhaps offer a possibility and reframe the way that Sarah um, interacted with the care team um, and to be able to build some trust because she seemed to be expressing a great distrust at the time. And so we prayed for that team and we prayed for um, their own uh, sense of compassion uh, to be uh, known through their care and through their work. After the fact, too, we worked with the palliative care team and the neonatologist to work um, to make sure that what was being said in Sarah's and Jessica's room was being expressed to them, too. And they were able to follow up and affirm that they, were, uh, they would support her and that they would uh, intervene uh, to help uh, Sarah when she was born. The second encounter happened just a few weeks later. Um, Sarah was born at about 32 weeks of gestation, and um, she survived. She uh, was taken to the NICU and required some CPAP or respiratory support, um, but it was uh, respiratory support that wasn't necessarily uncommon for a baby at 32 weeks gestation. Um, the family at that point said, hey, she's, she's uh, beating the odds. Um, they expressed lots of joy and thanks and relief that she um, had gotten to this point. Um, all of a sudden, I think they also began to hope. They began to hope that, hey, not only did she survive now, but maybe she'll be able to go home. Maybe uh, she'll be one of that five to eight percent that, um, that can survive to a year of life. Um, and that's what they began to cling to. And that's what began to adjust their own, um, their own hopes and dreams, their own goals as they went forward. Of course, during this, thing, uh, during this whole uh, time of care, the trajectory of care with uh, the James family, it, it spanned over several months. Um, and so uh, for the purposes of the case study, I, I haven't chronicled every encounter, um, but there are many times that I would stop by simply just to say hello, um, to offer um, a few words with, uh, with mom, with the baby, um, to provide that sense of presence, particularly being mindful that she was away from her communities of support, um, that she was, mom was often alone at the bedside, dad traveled for work and would come and go quite a bit. And so she ended up spending most of the time by herself at the bedside and providing that hospitality and support to her. I want to skip ahead now to the third uh, major encounter, and that was when Sarah was now four months old. Um, she had remained in the NICU for this whole time in the neonatal intensive care. Uh, she continued to require support. She continued um, to uh, need some respiratory support, uh, sometimes CPAP a couple of times having to be intubated for periods of time. Um, but her biggest challenge was that she had a heart defect that needed to be um, made, um, corrected through surgery. The thing that she needed the most was that she needed to be able to um, gain weight and she needed to have received surgery for that. Um, during this time, uh, it was also uh, present that her family was struggling too. Um, the more that the family was apart, uh, the more that the tension between uh, mom and dad grew, um, the distance perhaps, um, and also um, the need for their three-year-old, for Jackson, their three-year-old, to be able to be cared for. During this uh, particular encounter, uh, my attention was first on the baby and, and, and um, spending time um, with her and singing and, and sharing um, 
just some time with her as mom held her. But mom was agitated and she needed to talk and, and that was clearly evident by her body expressions. And so as, as I encouraged her to share what was on her mind, um, she shared that she had a lot of anxiety around surgery and, and the fact that a care team couldn't make a, a decision yet and, and who would make that decision and when that would happen and, and all the things that kind of swirl in the mind, especially um, when, uh, when you're under stress and uncertain about what's gonna happen next. And she was worried about her son. She was worried about Jackson, that his behavior um, while he was being cared for by family was, was struggling and, and they weren't sure what to do. And so um, this particular pastoral encounter was really focused on talking about Jackson's needs um, from a spiritual perspective, um, from a developmental perspective, um, wondering with mom, you know, what is it that he's expressing through uh, his acting out and, and recognizing that, you know, he's, he's trying to be independent, but doesn't, uh, doesn't want to be alone and that he misses mom and that he's, um, you know, needs that structure still for uh, his age. And, and as we talked, you know, she became more comfortable with recognizing that maybe they hadn't really talked a whole lot about what was going on in the hospital. And maybe there was a disconnect for him between um, what he was experiencing at home with his grandparents and what was happening and, and that maybe mom wanted to talk a little bit more with him about that and help him feel more connected. And so while we couldn't control what the surgeons wanted to do about the heart, we could help um, to address some of those stressors that were going on at home. And so myself with the palliative care team and child life worked together to uh, make a plan to help Jackson feel more connected as part of the care team and for mom and Jackson to feel more connected in their, uh, in their own relationship. Sarah did eventually go to uh, another hospital, um, a good distance away from home, a heart center uh, for surgery. And um, about a month later, she came back to us in the hospital. Um, unfortunately, the heart surgery, which they hoped would improve her respiratory status, didn't. And so in this next encounter uh, at about five months of age, um, the family was faced with making a decision about whether or not to, um, to seek a tracheostomy placement. Um, the tracheostomy would allow her, uh, the baby Sarah, to, to be somewhat more um, free, especially around her face. She wouldn't have to have a CPAP mask or to be, uh, have the endotracheal tube. Um, but at the same time, there was a lot of conversation about whether that was the best decision and the best interest for her as a baby. Um, the family, again, referred back to their faith and, and recognizing that, that Sarah was five months old. Again, they brought up the theme of she's beating the odds. Um, but they still struggled with, was it, was it uh, the right decision for her? What would her quality of life be like if she required a tracheostomy and if she required a ventilator for respiratory support? Um, but Trach also gave them, the, again, a renewed hope of perhaps being able to go home, and they felt really stuck in the moment. Um, Sarah was a gift from God. That was how the family understood her, and they expressed that she deserved every opportunity not only to survive, but in their, um, in their mind to thrive, and so they ultimately did decide to move forward with a trach placement. Over the next month after that trach placement, Sarah continued to grow. Um, she continued to uh, developmentally grow, but physically grow as well. Um, she had the trach placement, um, and part of the fact of having a trach was that her face was free. And so now she could interact more, she could ex be more expressive, she could uh, not be as sedated so that she could uh, be more interactive with her family as well. Um, she would kick, she would wiggle, she would uh, be playful and interactive and purposeful. Um, to visitors. She was not typical in her neurological development, um, but she was able to participate. You know, she uh, would smile and kick uh, to show kind of pleasure uh, when you would sing with her, when you would clap hands with her, play with toys. Um, she would click her tongue at you um, as if to be able to express her displeasure or her, her likes and dislikes. Um, and so, you know, family really saw that as a positive, that she had um, a quality to her life, even though she was still in the NICU, and that was really meaningful to them. Unfortunately, um, shortly after some of those encounters, um, Sarah's heart uh, essentially began to fail. Um, there was a time in which um, around seven months of age, um, the medical team called uh, for the chaplain to be at the bedside. Um, she was in a crisis. She was deteriorating quickly. Um, and, uh, uh, 
in, uh, the family had been called and so we were waiting for the family to come. When they came, um, they explained that her heart was failing, that they were maximizing their treatments and that it just wasn't, she wasn't responding and that she was at risk for a cardiac arrest imminently. Um, the medical staff requested a DNR and then um, politely and, and really um, graciously gave the family some space um, just to soak all of that in. And so they left the room, but Jessica and Steve and some of their immediate family and some of their church community um, circled around as, as Jessica held Sarah. Um, mom and dad uh, wept silently. Uh, there was no word spoken uh, for quite some time. And eventually uh, I stepped to the chair side and, um, and asked for prayer. Uh, words didn't seem um, really uh, useful in the moment, at least not a conversation. Um, but in prayer, knowing their history and their, uh, their own spirituality, um, we prayed for the decisions that they had to make. We prayed for comfort for Sarah, for the baby, for the family. Um, we prayed, um, and I recalled Sarah's birth story, um, some of the experiences they had had in the NICU as a way to try to honor um, all that she had, um, had done and all that she had uh, come. Uh, as they said, and using their words, you know, against, uh, against the odds, um, and then prayed for peace and comfort as they grappled with um, those decisions that they were facing. Um, there was a long silence after that again, and then um, Jessica uh, expressed, mom expressed, you know, she's already done so much. Um, she wasn't supposed to be here. No one thought she'd be here, um, but she also reflected that she, she felt like Sarah was tired, she said, you're so tired, aren't you, sweet girl? She said, I don't want you to suffer. It's okay, you can go. Um, if you're ready, you can go home. You can go be with Jesus. Um, through all the tears, that family um, ultimately decided to make her uh, do not resuscitate. And Sarah did, in fact, um, die a short time later. The trajectory of this case uh, spanned uh, seven months, almost seven and a half months. Um, and as I reflected on the case uh, and the story and trying to uh, write the case study, um, it was really apparent to me, one of my motivating factors was trying to help this family stay uh, in some way connected to their faith community. They lived more than an hour from their church and from their faith home. Um, and so part of my role as a chaplain was to be that extension of their community, um, that presence, that assurance um, there with them, and also to try to help um, support them in their own faith practices, not just individually in prayer, but their faith practices as a family. Um, so reading uh, a Bible story with the, with the patient, um, singing some of those songs that the family was familiar with from church school, um, and trying to, to be uh, an additional support for that family in that time. And I recognize that, you know, this case is about a, um, a very particular uh, faith tradition in Christianity and Pentecostal Christianity, and that's not my own tradition, uh, but um, able to, I was uh, able to continue to extend that um, community as a way of supporting them and what they needed. And that's something that the family reflected on afterwards. The mom um, called a couple of uh, days after they went home and said, you know, she didn't really get to have a church family because she never left the NICU, but expressed appreciation for the fact that she still had a church family uh, and the chaplaincy and spiritual care that was provided. So, um, I'm glad to share the story again. It's a little bit abbreviated uh, from what's uh, published, and I commend that to you as well, not because it's an amazing case study or my skills, but because um, there's a lot of details that uh, I think you would appreciate just in the, in the care. But um, I'm glad to share it with you, and uh, we'll look forward to uh, talking a little bit more about the specifics of the study ahead. Patrick, thank you so much. I always find myself a little bit teary as you're sharing that story because I think it is a really powerful um, series of encounters. Um, what I love about this case, and I'll go into this in a little while, is that um, it's so clear what your interventions were and what you did. And even as you're, you're sharing it, you know, what we were praying for. I think um, this is in many ways a research webinar as well. And one of the pieces in chaplaincy research that we're really talking about right now is we have to 
we have to understand what chaplains are actually doing, what their interventions are. Um, and you have written about this very beautifully. Um, so I also commend folks to read the case study um, and share it about it. I do want to ask you, you know, what was it like for you um, writing a case study for the first time? I know um, chaplains, we all write a lot of verbatims, but a case study is not a verbatim. Um, what was it like for you? Yeah, so, and I, th I think a little a little background, The um, I began the process of even thinking about it because, you know, as I kind of opened with, you know, I'm not a researcher, I'm a chaplain, um, but I do have an interest in knowing how things work and why things work. And and so uh, originally there was a call for papers for case studies that was uh, intended for a journal publication. And um, this case study eventually grew into, uh, out of that. Um, but uh, what kind of drew me initially was the fact that a case study was you telling a story. And I think in chaplaincy, we tell story uh, all the time. Um, and so um, I was interested in maybe trying that out. Um, and a case study seemed like something that was maybe a little less scary than a research project or, you know, data or, you know, those sorts of things. And so that's kind of what drew me to it. Um, I found it hard, though. Um, how do you decide what to write about one? Um, so I chose this particular story um, because it kind of uh, meshed a few things that we don't talk about a lot. Neonatal care, spiritual care of a neonate and what that looks like, especially in pediatric chaplaincy. Um, not just the family, but the baby too. Um, care, the ethical issues that were kind of uh, surrounding this case that we'll talk about in a few minutes as well. Um, but it was still, it was hard. How do you decide what to write? How do you decide what not to write about? How do you respect the story of this family, but at the same time, tell the details that we need to know to better understand, um, not just the what's of what we do, but the why's of what chaplaincy does, um, and particularly in pediatric chaplaincy. And uh, if you have, I know it's hard to sum things up in a few sentences, but if you have a sentence of advice for any chaplains kind of sitting there like, oh, maybe I have a case I could write, uh, what would you say? I would say just, 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 sit down and put pen to paper or, or you know, finger to key or something. Uh, you know, uh, I think our, our profession, as I've reflected more on it, we really need to know what we're doing and why we're doing it. And the only way to do that is to have stories. Um, and so, you know, even stories that are not um, huge, profound, complex, ethically laden, you know, um, care examples are important too. And so I really would encourage uh, just, just, put it down and write it down, and then worry about some of those other details later. I love that. Well, we are gonna um, take a turn um, here to talking with um, Dr. Naomi Laventhal. We're so, so happy to have you here. Um, she is a neonatologist um, at, at the University of Michigan Mott Children's Hospital. Um, she is a clinical associate professor in the Department of Pediatrics in the Division of Neonatology, and she's also a faculty ethicist. Um, when I asked her for her bio, she said, I think one of the most important things is to say I do a lot of ethics consults and a lot of ethics work um, directly with our um, pregnant moms. Um, who are coming in with some of these um, issues and some of these questions. So we are so excited to have her. Um, I've kind of framed three questions here to have her uh, respond to. And really the first one that I think is coming right from this case study um, is what are some of the bigger ethical issues that you heard in this case um, and that you see in other cases around um, trisomy 18? And I also have 13 here. 13 is a different trisomy, but there are some similar presentations um, and often a similar prognosis, which is why we put them together. Um, yeah, what, what do you see here? So, um, so I think you've developed some really great questions and it, it, is, it is definitely true that in most of the contemporary work both neonatologists and ethicists are doing around the trisomies, the 13 and 18 do get grouped together quite a bit. I think parents of those kids would probably have a lot to say about the differences, which is important to remember. Yeah. But um, to me, I think a lot of the contemporary unanswered questions in pediatric ethics are embodied in the care of children with trisomy 13 and 18 before and after birth. And um, a lot of what comes out, I think, in the, the beautiful case study is this tension in pediatric ethics between parental authority and, and this sort of classic 
definition of a child's best interest. Um, you know, I didn't say parental autonomy. We've really moved away from talking about autonomy as, as the characterization of what parents are doing when they make decisions for their children. Um, it's related, but it really is a different kind of activity. So that we're, we're talking a lot about parental authority now. And you see that tension play out, I think, a little bit in Jessica in this case, where she has this sense of, I, I know what I think is right for my daughter, and I'm worried that people won't do what, I'm, what I've asked them to do. I think that that's a common worry, and that's a common tension, in, particularly in pediatric and neonatal intensive care units. So that comes out really strongly in this case. Um, and I think when we play that out a little bit, it really comes down to how we think about what best interest really means for a child and how we think about benefit and burden, right? And so generally in this pure sense, we talk about interventions being appropriate if there's some chance that they'll achieve the desired goal without undue burden on the child. But what benefit really means and how a child experiences burdensome therapies, it, it's really hard to know, especially for an infant. And different values placed on survival and survival without major disability, I think, play in a lot to what, uh, what best interest means. And elicitation of goals in the space is so important because, because um, you know, the, the, we used to talk about this in terms of, of futility concepts, but, but that if the goal is, you know, survival to an elder, elderly age with a typical neurologic presentation, maybe that's not a reasonable goal and maybe no interventions are going to achieve that. But if the goal is I want to spend as much time with my baby as I can, I want to get home with my baby, those are kinds of things that I think we really can work towards. And it, at least in this population, a lot of the, the concerns that I hear about a goal being, I, I don't want people to write my baby off. And I think that comes out in this case a lot too, is you know, what if sort of everything gets decided based on this ultrasound and no one meets my baby and actually finds out what could be done for my baby. So I think thinking about goals in a really flexible and open way comes out in this case. Um, one thing that comes up a lot in my practice is, um, I talk a lot, I work with a lot of residents and trainees and also young nurses, is, is trying to be thoughtful in the way we characterize hope and distinguishing that from denial. And I think that in, in the sort of intense world of intensive care, particularly for trainees, there's this leaning towards mischaracterizing expressions of hope as denial and, and saying, you know, they, they don't get it. And if they knew, they wouldn't want this and they're in denial. And, and, and if we offer them any, any, any sort of scope of prognosis that includes a reasonably good outcome, we're giving them false hope. And, and I worry about that a lot, actually, and I worry about um, people not taking the time to really sort out the difference. And I'll skip ahead to the next question a little and say, I think that's one place where chaplaincy can be really helpful to us, is in, in trying to tease that out a little bit, and the role of hope. Um, in lots of studies of prenatal consultation, mostly around extreme prematurity, parents tell us in studies again and again that what they look for in the counselor is less about statistics and specific survival odds and more being able to identify a sense of hope and optimism from the counselor. Um, another, I think, important uh, ethical consideration in this is thinking about uncertainty and prognostic, prognostic uncertainty. And in the age of really advanced prenatal testing and a lot of advanced technology in the ICUs, our ability to predict the future is very, isn't very good. Um, and there's, there's both sort of real uncertainty, just there, there's only so precise we can get with with predicting the future. Um, and the other is, and I, this came out in the case a little bit too, this sense of what if your tests are just wrong and you've got this, you've got this ultrasound and I know you see what you see and I trust you, but you haven't met my baby and what if you're wrong? And sort of that hope that maybe it's not as bad as the doctors have said it is, I think is really prevalent in a lot of different conditions that are diagnosed before birth. Um, the, uh, the last thing I just want to mention about this question is, and this came, I thought about this a lot in reading about Sarah's case, is this idea of whether a child can, who spends months or even years in the hospital can also be living a good life. And I think we've historically thought that if you can't go home and you can't be with your family and, you, and you're, you're surrounded by IV poles and tubings and hospital monitors that you must not be living a good life. And I'm not sure that that's as true as, as we think it is. And if you think about 
you know, that was the only life Sarah had. And certainly I would imagine that her parents put a great amount of value on that life that she had in the hospital. And so I think being flexible when we think of like what makes a life good for a baby with a major problem, um, it's, it's well characterized by trisomy 13 and 18. That's reminding me of um, a paper that I often cite as the paper that made me fall in love with research. I like it more than I like Harry Potter. Um, it's a paper <laughs> that's called um, Living with Distress and Enrichment. And it's interviews of, of parents of children utilizing high technology in their their um, conclusions where these parents do experience a lot of distress, worrying about their child's quality of life, are they suffering, um, but they also experience a lot of enrichment um, and they believe their child's life is enriched by the technology and so finding that balance, um, I hear that coming out. What changes have you seen um, in how we treat and sort of ethically understand trisomy 18 um, and 13 cases in the last years? So I think I've certainly seen a lot of change in that um, in, you know, since I started training to now, which been, has been about 15 years, um, both in the way that we approach trisomy 13 and 18 specifically, and I think broader trends in how we approach other serious um, congenital syndromes. Um, when I think back to my own training when I was a fellow and, and how that's, and where we are now, it's almost unrecognizable. I think that many people and many practicing neonatologists and obstetricians came up in a time that trisomy 13 and 18 was considered to be a, a lethal anomaly, which is a term that's really fallen out of favor because families really don't like it. Um, but we really thought that the options, if you had one of these conditions, were pregnancy termination or comfort care after birth. And, um, and I don't want to say that this has been uniform around the country, but certainly there's, I, I think there's a fairly cohesive shift away from this idea that the only rational care plan for a live born baby with trisomy 13 or 18 is comfort care. Um, there are a lot of, of providers who still think that and a lot of hospitals who, who, um, who practice that way, which has given rise to this idea of the trisomy friendly hospital which are sort of make their way around kind of support groups and social networks of um, families of these kids talking about where to go if you want to be offered a broader set of choices. So I think that's been a huge change. Um, and I think there's also been a lot of attention, you know, people are really starting to characterize the outcomes of children with this. And I think there's good empirical reason to push back against the idea that this is, you know, almost universally uh, lethal in the first year of life. Um, and probably in you guys' work as well, you come, you come a lot to this idea of the self-fulfilling prophecy, which is that if we don't offer treatment to these kids on the basis that they all die, that's what happens and reinforces our, our sort of false sense of the epidemiology. Um, and there are fairly large cohorts and experts in this field who've started descri to describe much longer term survivors and a, I think a broader spectrum of functional outcomes among the survivors. So kids who walk and smile and feed themselves and, and come to reunions and, and, and sort of meet each other. Um, so certainly when I was training, there was this idea that the pictures of smiling children in trisomy 18, with trisomy 18 that people could find on the internet were kind of deeply misleading um, and sort of gave, gave families, again, this idea of false hope. And it's not clear that those pictures are that misleading for at least a subset of kids who have this. Um, I also think more broadly as a community of you know, obstetricians and perinatal care providers, I think we are coming to, around to allowing more plurality in what parents want and more of a let's make a plan for the amount of inter intervention that's just right for you and your family, acknowledging that loving parents can choose everything from pregnancy termination to really any uh, intervention that we'll ever offer. Um, and I think that leads really well to this very nice concept of the trial of therapy, which is something that we talk a lot about a lot in, in neonatology, which is really trying to get to the place with parents where we say, we understand that this is a really serious di diagnosis that has profound impl implications for your child's life. Um, and we understand that you would like us to try some of these things, but you can in imagine a time that maybe you wouldn't want these things or that there might be some things that you wouldn't try. And that, that plays out pretty nicely, I think, in the, the, the part of the case study where there's this discussion of whether or not the tracheostomy was going to be pursued. 
And I would describe that tracheostomy as fitting reasonably well in a palliative care plan um, to sort of optimize her life while she was living it. So I think there's been a lot more flexibility in thinking about um, congenital heart disease surgery and tracheostomy and other surgeries for kids with, um, with, with trisomy 18. Although, you know, we're still hearing stories about, you know, a planned gastrostomy tube, which then doesn't go ahead because no one can find an anesthesiologist willing to perform general anesthesia on a baby with trisomy 18. So because I think I work in a setting where we are fairly willing to do a lot of fairly invasive things for these populations, I sometimes don't get as much of a glimpse as places that are, don't have a very cohesive approach to it yet. Thank you. Yeah, I, I certainly have seen some of those changes in the last five years that I've been um, working with this population. Um, I think Patrick's case study describes those changes. I loved in your case study, Patrick, you mentioned um, how Jessica, Sarah's mom, went online and she found some information um, on the internet. Um, and that, I think that is a huge um, dynamic that we're seeing in some of these changes as well. And it's not necessarily misleading, I think, as you've shared, Naomi, um, but it's, it's a balance we strike. So before I ask my um, last question directly here to Dr. Laventhal, um, I want to remind folks that there is a Q&A feature um, in these Zoom webinars. Um, if you click the box that says Q&A, you should be able to type in any questions that you have um, for uh, Patrick, for Naomi, um, for myself. We would love to have a discussion with you. Um, how are you, you know, what are the questions that you face as you uh, run into these families in your work? Um, what questions do you have medically about trisomy 18 or trisomy 13? Um, what questions do you have about uh, chaplain intervention? Um, and what kinds of interventions can be effective for these families? And especially around how chaplains can be engaged in ethical questions, um, which is my next question for Dr. Laventhal. You work with chaplains. Um, how do you see chaplains being involved uh, in the ethical, uh, like the ethical stuff. I, there's not a better word, but stuff. Like just the ethical stuff of some of these questions in some of these cases. So um, it, it's hard. To, it's hard to to, to follow the um, follow the the case with my own observations about that. But I I see sort of two avenues that are really important. And I will say, prior to reading this case, I hadn't really thought much about the interaction of the chaplain directly with the infant or in thinking about the spiritual needs of the young sibling. And so that was really informative to, for me. Thank you for that. But um, I, so I do a lot of joint uh, prenatal consultation with our palliative care team. Um, we don't always have their chaplain with us in the consultation just because we try not to have the parents feel like they're facing 10 people at once. But um, they can be really involved. And I, I certainly think in helping us compassionately um, and kind of expertly elicit the role of spirituality in the decisions that parents are facing, I think can be really helpful. Um, especially if we're thinking about a, a situation where the infant really might pass away shortly after birth, I think trying to do a little bit better than think about things like baptism as a as a box on a checklist mm -hmm. and really think a little more substantively about what will be important if that baby passes away right, right after birth. I think that can be really helpful. Um, I, I think hospital chaplains in particular, if, if, I, if you compare hospital chaplains to maybe the family's own pastor, you know, I think are uniquely poised to really understand how the hospital works and understand a little bit more about the medicine and help parents, I think, grapple with tough questions without themselves being pretty lost about what it is that the parents are really being really asked to do. I mean, I think many, you know, highly educated professionals in, in society are kind of astonished to learn about the complexity of neonatal care and the, the gut-wrenching nature of the decisions parents have to make. And I think that hospital chaplains are really uniquely poised to understand that. And I think kind of bridge that divide for families to, to help them think through tough medical decisions. Um, you know, and particularly thinking about this decision about the tracheostomy and this sort of in the moment consideration of the code status. I think that sort of like in the moment, understanding what this really is, getting called to codes, that experience, I think, for of chaplains of being there in, in that kind of tough decision and in death is really, is probably invaluable to families. Um, 
But I also see, certainly in my ICU, a lot of role for chaplains in working with the with individual or groups of medical providers. Um, I think that, you know, I and my colleagues feel a lot of different kinds of moral distress in caring for kids like this. Um, one thing that I, you know, have had my own journey working through is this idea that sometimes parents want things for their children that you wish they didn't want. And often what you mean when you say that is, I wouldn't want this if it were my baby. And I think chaplains can be really helpful to people to one, work through why someone might want something that you would never want for your baby. And also maybe help you find a way to sit with that, that difficulty, especially if that disconnect comes from the provider's own spirituality and the provider's own sense of what would be the morally right thing to do. Um, <clears throat> and so I think that can be really helpful. Um, I also think sometimes after the death of a patient like this, they can be really helpful to our team, you know, in both unexpected death and in, in what we call sometimes negotiated death or, or, or sort of planned transition of care where even if intellectually the provider can recognize that we did the right thing or we did everything we could, they can feel a lot of loss and I think of their own spiritual distress. And, you know, I see our hospital chaplain sometimes in the middle of the night, so it's not even our regular person. You know, it's someone who's come over from the adult hospital to help us out at night, just sit in the room with our nurses after, after a code or something like that. And, um, and I think that I'm always really grateful that that falls into the spectrum of what, what chaplains will provide in cases like this. I think that's huge and that's a big conversation. Um, having We're all having in the chaplaincy world. Patrick, I'm gonna put you on the spot. Um, how in this case, or I, I, I would say even more broadly, in cases similar um, to baby Sarah's, how have you as a chaplain um, attended to your own moral distress at times, um, but also to the moral distress that you you perceive um, when you have staff members um, saying things like, you know, I wouldn't do that for my baby. Yeah, I think I think something that Naomi that you said that really resonated is um, being able to sit with it um, and that distress in oneself and in and, and others. Um, one of the things that you mentioned early on is uh, with a family, especially when they're working with providers and um, may, you know, students and learners and others is, you know, are you with me? Um, and especially when you think around hope and denial and false hope. And um, one of the things that I think the chaplain's uniquely positioned to do is, is have a foot in both worlds, um, to have a foot uh, in the in support of faith and support of the family and support of kind of the, the are you with me piece, but also do the same thing for the medical team. And I think it's, it's, it's a, it's a um, it's really an honor. It's a, a sacred piece to be able to do that, but also it's a really important practical piece um, to be able to say to the medical team, listen, you know, here's how we can come alongside and maybe be uh, one of the people who helps to, to bring the medical team alongside um, the family. But particularly around, you know, moral distress, yeah, there are certainly times where one feels like, gosh, this is not what I would want for my child. Um, and so I think, you know, from an internal perspective, really trying to wonder, um, to be curious about um, what it is about the situation that, um, that strikes me in that, that regard, um, to be able to name it to myself, to be aware of it. Uh, but then also that helps me kind of to set it aside and recognize this isn't my story. Um, this isn't my child. Um, and, but also to, to let that inform how you interact with the family. Um, because if I'm asking that question, you know, maybe there's a chance that that internal dialogue is going on uh, within, within them as well. Um, and so trying to offer um, space and permission to, to go there. Um, I, I didn't necessarily mention it in the case study, but and even just in reflecting on it today, you know, one of the things in that last prayer with the family before they decided to make her a DNR uh, was really, I think, an intention um, to offer permission for the family to, to decide not to do a DNR. Uh, it was not explicit, but, you know, naming her journey and naming where she had come from and recognizing all the things that she had accomplished, to use their words, um, and also giving permission to, to say, maybe this is an okay time to say, um, this, is, this is a time where this is the line that we don't want to go. You know, um, a trache uh, being intubated was suffering. A tracheostomy was not suffering for this family. 
because it freed her up to be able to do more. Um, but um, receiving CPR, receiving you know uh, chest compressions, uh, that was suffering to them. To see her it, as her heart was failing physically, she was looking very ill. She was ill appearing as well, and the family saw that, and they saw that she was really agitated, um, that she did not look comfortable anymore. She was not happy. She was in distress, and so they saw that as suffering, and so offering them that permission. And so uh, I think being able to name those those things, not necessarily directly to the family, but be curious about them is really important. Uh, and I think it goes the same for staff too, um, to be able to say, hey, I'm with you, even if I don't share all of those thoughts. Um, and let's, let's not be afraid of them. Uh, let's be able to talk about them. This is all really, um, really relevant stuff to the work that any of us that work in uh, NICUs, I think, see almost every day. Um, I, my goal here was to offer just a few summary comments, but we also want to uh, respond to questions um, that you may have either about case study writing, ethics, um, the case itself and Patrick's care. Um, so please don't hesitate to um, ask some questions um, here in this question box uh, that should be on your screen. You know, for me, in you know, part of why we chose this case is I think it illustrates so many pieces. Um, from a very purely research perspective, um, the, the thing I really want to emphasize today is that um, case study research is research. Um, case studies are a form of research. Um, one of our biggest goals, and actually, um, as we were gathering before, um, Dr. Laventhal said, so, so what do chaplains research? <laughs> and I said, one of the big things that we're researching is what do chaplains do? Um, we also need to move towards and what difference does it make? I mean, I really think that this case study um, is research in that it illustrates what the chaplain does and the difference that it makes. Um, you know, in a perfect world, Patrick, you could go back um, and interview that family now <laughs> um, to learn even more. Um, but we really um, want to encourage folks to write case studies um, because I, I think about what if we had eight case studies? Um, from chaplains all over the US or the world caring for children with trisomy 18. What would what would that tell us? That would really start to get us some fabulous data. You know, you know, Patrick is great about what he prayed for. And what if we could look at eight case studies and say what was the chaplain praying for with the family? Um, and you know, Naomi talked a lot about the importance of helping families really clarify their goals um, while recognizing that hope is not the same thing as denial. Um, you know, how are chaplains helping families in cases like this clarify their goals? Um, I think that is one thing that case studies, you know, can help us do really, really well. Um, and if you've been through CPE or, or in CPE, you are learning to write verbatims and case studies can be done in verbatim format um, or in narrative format. Um, and that's really where we excel as chaplains is narrative. Um, and I love that our narrative practice can also become our research practice. Um, the ethics piece here that really, um, you know, caught my interest when I was reading this case study um, had to do with um, the fact that she got a tracheostomy. Um, my actual area of research is parental decision making around tracheostomies. And I really appreciate um, how there's a balanced approach in the way you've written about this case study. And then we've gotten to talk about this a little bit with um, Dr. Laventhal, you know, how tracheostomy uh, can be a decision that I think for some families is not, I use the phrase faith concordant, um, where it's being done as a last ditch effort, as a, you know, trying to preserve something when maybe that goal isn't actually you know, a reasonable goal. The tracheostomy is not going to reverse the neurological effects um, of trisomies. And I have worked with families who really hoped that. Um, and it can also be something that allows a quality of life. Um, the, the ability to sort of roll around and to make facial expressions. Um, I say all the time to my parents that our trait kids um, are all going to be famous actors because they, because they can't vocalize. They've learned to use their faith, face to tell you kind of everything. Um, and I love that aspect of this case and that aspect of being engaged in the decision making process, um, even if that's not saying do this or do that, but being a sounding board um, and holding silence in that DNR decision. Um, silence can be really powerful. And I, I do believe that it is a chaplaincy skill 
that is a unique thing that we can bring to the team. We have one question here um, that I, I think is a great one. Um, this is, uh, Rebecca Freeman is asking um, whether the concept of a miracle was ever named uh, by Sarah's family. And if, if it was, how did you work with that? Um, miracle is a big word uh, in neonatology. So um, I'll ask that to uh, Patrick and then Naomi if you have a few comments. Certainly, yeah. I mean, miracle is, I mean, it's a loaded word, right? And what, is, what does it mean uh, for that particular family? Um, interestingly, um, I don't think, in, to my recollection, this family really never used the miracle um, terminology. Um, they uh, use the hope a lot. We hope for her to be able to be uh, carried to, to gestational age. We hope that she can um, survive. We hope that she can come home. Uh, didn't really use miracle, although I would say that a lot of their understanding of what was happening might often be equated with miracle type language too, even though they didn't use it. Um, so um, yeah, so they didn't use it, but um, I do, I mean, obviously we hear it a lot, especially in the NICU, uh, but uh, even in our oncology setting and our other in our PICU after a tragic accident and, and so on. Um, and so um, yeah, how do, how do I understand and work with that concept? Um, I try to understand what they mean by miracle and what they hope for in, in that miracle. Um, and then again, you know, the idea of coming alongside, um, allowing for hope, um, but also um, trying to hold the tension of what we know medically. And so oftentimes I'll say something of, I hope for that too. Um, and, uh, you know, we can still think about what happens next. And sometimes families can't go there and we have to respect that too. Um, for some families uh, and some traditions, uh, and even if it's not in their faith tradition, you know, they say, I have to hope this, I have to expect this, I can't think anything else. And so um, we have to really, that's, it's hard. You have to hold it in tension. Yeah. I have another question here I really want to get to before you run out of time. Um, and that is an observation here that, uh, Sarah's family, Jessica and her husband are very religious. Um, and that is not true of every family uh, with trisomy 18 and 13 as a diagnosis and every family we encounter. Um, you know, what does this look like for families who are not uh, as connected to communities of faith as religious, both um, pastorally and ethically? Mm -hmm. And I'll ask both of you. Um, I'm going to give a short answer because I want to leave some time, but what I'd say is that I've had some parents express to me sort of a sense of duty to their community that they then feel a little stuck with. Um, so either maybe not being perfectly in line with their church or with the, with the groups. Um, and so I do think that parents of kids with trisomy 18 who are a little more ambivalent and not really willing to go on this very public journey of their story of miracle and hope. Sometimes, at least in my experience, have expressed feeling like they don't really know what their place is mm -hmm. in this. Um, and that's not necessarily only about religion, but I think it's sometimes related to that. And I think, um, you know, yes, this family is, identifies very, very, very much with the, the religious component of it, but um, the spiritual needs, I would argue, go far beyond what a particular tradition teaches or, um, or uh, so, you know, that need for connection to a community of support, the need to be able to express their hope and where that comes from, whatever that, um, that might be, um, their need to feel connected to something bigger than themselves. Um, these are all themes that come up often, even for families who don't identify with a particular faith group or a particular tradition. Um, you know, families still have some sense of um, where their ethic, their moral compass comes from. Um, and so sometimes uh, it's harder for them to name that or to express that. Um, but still, you, uh, to me, it's still a need of the spirit to be able to explore that and to support that and be curious about that, um, even if the the language may not be faith language, um, you know, uh, still a need to, to experience beauty, still a need to experience those things that bring awe and joy uh, in life. And so how do we help them to connect to that, um, whether the language is faith language or not, uh, becomes a, an important role for me. And um, I'll piggyback off of that to say, in your written case study, 
um, in the book, you really detail what your assessment process is, which I also think is, is applicable to families of a wide variety of faith or spirituality without a particular faith. Um, and so that's a really great, valuable thing. I will show off the book here. Um, it is our uh, case studies in chaplaincy and spiritual care um, that we're very uh, excited about. We need to start wrapping up, but um, I have a few resources here on this slide. I am gonna be posting all of these and a few more um, in the network. Um, this is both of the case study books, both of which have a section in pediatrics. Um, although I believe those are nearly the only pediatric chaplaincy case studies available are the ones in the book. Um, there's a third case study book coming out um, that Jeannie Werpsa edited um, that doesn't include pediatrics, but is about decision making. I think that will be out in April. Um, Dr. Laventhal has provided a couple of papers. I've put one here, um, but I will link to all of them um, through PubMed in the network. Um, that really go into some of these issues from a very ethical perspective. Um, and then there's another great paper um, that Dr. George Fischette has written, um, just why we need case studies. Um, kind of go into this case studies, our research um, that I've put here. Um, and a few kind of housekeeping announcements. Um, obviously, we give lots of thanks to Transforming Chaplaincy, to uh, Patrick Jinks, to Naomi Laventhal. Um, and to ACPE, who generously donates their technology and some of their time. Um, and also, we have a few announcements we want to make um, to please join the actual network if you haven't yet. Um, it's hosted through Mighty Networks. You can join the main network and then join the pediatrics network. Um, we have a few things happening in the pediatric spiritual care network. There's some conversations happening about using patient reported outcome measures and potentially getting a group of us together this summer to trial these in our own uh, work. I've had a few requests uh, since announcing this webinar for a more in-depth case study writing workshop, and that's something we're looking to provide um, in spring, summer, maybe um, providing a format and doing um, some sort of workshops over Zoom um, to encourage folks to write these case studies and give some um, guidance in that. APC, uh, Association of Professional Chaplains, we have webinar journal club that's coming up on Tuesday. If you aren't registered for the series yet, you can register for individual ones. Um, and that is on physician aid in dying and physician assisted suicide and specifically um, the views of American clergy. It's a paper by um, the Balbonis, if you know them. They're a prolific uh, uh, doctor and a pastoral researcher. Um, and then lastly, Transforming Chaplaincy does offer um, more guided courses in uh, research literacy for chaplains. This is really to be able to pick up a paper from the Journal of Healthcare Chaplaincy, um, the Journal of Palliative Medicine or Pain and Symptom Management, um, and be able to read it and understand uh, the narrative as well as some of the statistics. Um, 101 is running now, and I think there'll be a few other sessions. And 102, which is to really dive deeper, um, which I... I know the folks who did the curriculum for these and I think they're fabulous. Um, that is coming up in April. So with that, um, that is kind of the main thing we have today. Thank you so much uh, to our guest presenters. Thank you for everyone for attending. I look forward to seeing you in the network. Feel free to email me directly if you have any questions um, or to get in touch with me through the network. Thank you all so much. Thank you.